So, how many students are there here? No me oye. Oh, good. Ma, ma paga. Wow, there's a good group. Are most of you in social work? Urban planning? Psychology? Anybody in psychology? Oh, good. No Urban psychology. Finance. finance? All right. Urban planning, social work. Good, good. I was hoping that we'd get a group of good students uh, because I think I'm addressing this talk to different uh, students to energize your vision and, and, and your interest in mental health. The title, um, we'll go to the third one. The title of this talk is very specific. I'm uniting three concepts, Sique, Subjectivity, and Puerto Rican Mental Health. I'll start first though with letting you know what the Centro, and I'm glad that Dr. Gonzalez spoke a little bit about the Centro is opening up its, uh, its doors, its center to looking at mental health issues, which never has been done. I don't think there is one Puerto Rican Studies program that looks at issues with mental health, and that's unfortunate. So this is a real first for the center. And these are the things we'd like to do. We're starting with a seminar. We're gonna be developing a mental health uh, collections library here. So that that's gonna be an addition and then we'll, we'll prepare an annotated bibliography. We're going to publicize a, a book of critical readings because part of what happens is that the students who get out there don't read a lot of the things that, that I for one read and think they should be reading about Puerto Rican mental health because it's not in the curriculum or you don't have Latino staff or Puerto Rican uh, staff and faculty and you don't get to know a lot of interesting things that are going on. So uh, that's going to be publicized as soon as we finish it. So we're going to have a course at some point, a forum on mental health and some research projects. Okay. So there's going to be a series of activities that's, that spans like about two years. <laughs> that's not in this semester or anything like that. That's a long term. That's okay. What, is, what are the theoretical, theoretical orientations of what I want to share with you today? This work attempts to look at the psyche, at subjectivity, and Puerto Rican mental health of the diaspora, that is, Puerto Ricans in the mainland. We will look at some comparisons, but what are the theoretical orientations that energize my, uh, or inform, inform me? Basically, and you'll note that I, I try not to look at the, my paper, I try to talk, basically, I start with critical psychology. Critical psychology is not in your curriculum, um, I don't think. Where are you studying? Where are you studying psychology? You're, you're a hunter, okay. I, I said that I don't think critical psychology is in your curriculum. Critical psychology is an emerging um, psychological focus which looks critically at functions, psychological functions, but in the context of society, in the context of political groups, in the context not just of development, not just what happens in the brain, but in the context of a series of factors that occur in life. And it is a psychology, a psychology that is concerned with oppressed people, with people who have been marginalized, with people that have been colonized, and attempts to create a psychology for empowerment and for the betterment and social justice. So critical psychology is one of those. And basically critical psychology comes from critical theory. And critical theory, if you haven't heard, comes from the Frankfurt School in the 30s. Marcuse was one, Horkheimer. These were theorists that were looking critically at psychoanalysis. They thought that Freud didn't was being too linear in his thinking and they wanted to contextualize psychoanalysis. So that's part of the tradition of critical psychology. The other perspective is the 
Latin American liberation psychology of the 80s and the 90s, which are spearheaded by Martin Baró. How many have you heard of Ignacio Martin Baró? Okay, there's some hands around. Good. Ignacio Martin Baró was an incredible Spanish Jesuit priest who was assassinated in El Salvador in November 18th of 1989. I had just met him in June of that year in a conference in, in Argentina. And he spearheaded, he had been 20 years in El Salvador, and he's a social psychologist. And what he did was, he was so uh, concerned about the war in El Salvador, the trauma that he was seeing in people, that he started to develop his own thinking, which is part of what many of us try to do. We try to put together what works for us. And that's what he, he's coming out with saying, there are things that work for Latin America, there's things that work for our people, that don't work for Chicago, that don't work for New York, that don't work for Europe, but they work for Latin America and they work for oppressed people. So his psychology tries, is, is geared towards empowering, but more importantly, it's geared to developing a new epistemological lens. He teaches us how to look. You know, the famous word nowadays in critical studies and post-colonial theory is the gaze, right? Well, he teaches a gaze that is really concerned about actually seeing what happens in reality to people, poor people, oppressed people. And he developed the notion of psychosocial trauma. Before the trauma theorist came out with the cultural theorist recently, Martin Baro was talking about psychosocial trauma. The um, pedagogy of the oppressed, all of those who are in, in education know, teaches us how to problematize, which is to look at things, question them, and start developing answers from them, and start to know from what we're seeing to create a new reality. And that is this, uh, Pablo Freire's concern with conscien conscientization, consci conscientiation. What do you mean? Conscientization. Conscientiation. Consciousness. Con no, no, it's conscientization. Conscientiation. The making of consciousness. Thank you. That's a good uh, and, and the importance of that is that he worked as a, a teacher in Latin America teaching people who did not know how to read and write. And he developed a method, if you don't know about it, that is through teaching and how you teach to read and write, he also was making them, helping them to become conscious of their social reality of oppression. So it's, it's, it has become extremely big in education for the last 30 years. Trauma theory and melancholia both come from psychoanalytic thinking and from post-colonial um, uh, critiques about coloniality to the degree that we may be considered post-colonial, that's, that's being debated hotly because it's so hot, you know, everybody jumps on those bandwagons of post-coloniality, but I don't know if the Puerto Rican situation can be considered post-colonial. I have resorted to using the notion of coloniality, which is developed by a group of Latin American sociologists and anthropologists, and one Puerto Rican, Torre Maldonado and Anibal Quijano and Dussel. So coloniality helps us understand exactly the, the implications is that, that because you do not have a colonial administration, that doesn't mean you have not, you're still uncolonized or you're decolonized. No, on the contrary, what coloniality says is that colonial relations persist, unfortunately, and survive post the administration period and exist and persist precisely in our psyche. And the difficulty has always been how we enter into processes of decolonialization. And for us, that may even be more difficult because Puerto Rico has a problem that it doesn't know it's colonized. It acts as if it isn't, okay? It acts as if it was a first world country and has never come to grips with the fact that we have had an experience of 500 years of colonization that definitely leaves marks in the psyche of a people. But we've never really been able, except small groups, to really deal with that. It's not like the Native Americans, for example,
that have begun projects, you know, for groups of people of decolonialization because they have understood that that is the process that they need to do. So those are the, the uh, social psychoanalysis. I wanted to, to finalize with that um, and sneak a look at my, my notes here. Social psychoanalysis is basically an, uh, psycho, uh, it's aware, Freud has some interesting, very interesting uh, concepts, but the ones that social psychoanalysis is concerned with are those concepts of psychoanalysis that are relevant to the person in society, that are relevant to understanding how oppression occurs. What is the mechanism of oppression? How do people get oppressed? How do they internalize the other? How do they decompensate? What, you know, all issues and terms of psychoanalysis, how does that happen in the mind and through the body and the actions? So social psychoanalysis is highly concerned with some concepts, but how they occur in society for the betterment, for the uh, decolonization of the mind, and has some very interesting um, women, women theorists, and a couple of male theorists that have, uh, you will get a, a reference list, it'll be, it'll be posted. All right, let's go to the next one. The, what I would like to say about melancholia, when I'm gonna read it before we go on to voices, is that one of the areas that I'm thinking about in terms of Puerto Rican in the United States from clinical experience and from observation and from the theory is I'm trying to, to see to what degree the theory of trauma and melancholia is applicable to the Puerto Rican experience. I think part of it may be, maybe not completely. What does the theory of melancholia tell us? This is Freud's, uh, one of his most interesting uh, developments, his writing of 1917. He wrote a paper on mourning and melancholia. And he indicated that the melancholic refuses to relinquish the lost, loved object, but is unconscious of this. In mourning the loss of the conscious, he learns to resolve it. But if you don't mourn, if you cannot resolve, then you have maintained an open wound. Cultural critics are using this concept, the inability to mourn. Mourning is a conscious process. Melancholia is an unconscious process. If you do not mourn, you are at risk, if you will, of suffering from melancholia. So what, how does this relate to the diaspora? What the cultural critics have said, and this is where they, it's, it's an interesting way of tying it, is that melancholia helps explain the wounds of history, the open wounds of history, the wounds that people who have been displaced from their lands have upon the loss of a homeland. And you say, well, wait a minute. What are those wounds? When people get displaced, when they leave, there is a sense of you've lost something. You may not know exactly what you've lost, and some others do, but there's a series of processes going on, you know, there's nostalgia. And even you hear in the youth and people say, you know, I miss this, I miss that. And we will later see some data of studies of depression that make us wonder why is this occurring and if this has anything to do with a sense of overwhelming loss and or melancholia. So the concept of melancholia is a collective and an individual concept which 
looks towards seeing diasporic situations, persons who have traveled, who have moved and lost their homeland. The thought is that when you lose your homeland, you have to somehow get a new one. But you get a new one sometimes through ambivalent processes. And one of the words that crops up constantly in issues of Puerto Rican identity, and not only ours, of other ethnic groups in the United States is precisely ambivalence. Mm -hmm. Our ambivalence comes from, from you know, we don't, you didn't even have to be diasporic to be ambivalent. We just have ambivalence because of the political situation in Puerto Rico is a structured ambivalence, okay? But in diasporic, what happens is when you come, the melancholic paradigm tells us that there's a period of time that the person doesn't know whether it wants to leave or stay. And if it can't leave, because they live way on the other side of the world, they have to stay. And if they stay, are they betraying their love of home and their sense of loss? Okay? And if they stay, how can they assimilate? And what does that mean with their sense of loyalty? What do you do? These are cases also. And this kind of theorizing makes it interesting when you can go through a case. We will go through two cases, but um, one has some of that, of this. But one has to work through that loss psychologically. You have to work through that loss making some attempts at recovering through memory what you have lost so that it becomes conscious. Remember that melancholia is an unconscious process. And the Freudian paradigm tells us that to make things conscious is what we need to do, to be aware, okay? Further, so melancholia is interesting. I, I'm finding some interesting things about melancholia. I do think that the pioneers, I didn't talk to you about this. I do think that there's evidence that the first groups of Puerto Ricans who came to Puerto Rico it came from Puerto Rico to New York, may have suffered melancholia, but they worked it through by precisely developing, what, what was it, pequeños barrios, pequeños centros, the center cultural of el barrio, the center <coughs> cultural of this and that. They started to develop community, Puerto Rican community. So when you see these old pictures that used to be up here, okay, <laughs> You see uh, the, the, the storefront of so-and-so, the community center, you know, groupings, because that was one way of keeping the homeland alive here. And that is an adaptive force. When you can't do that, or for some reason it doesn't happen, you may not have that resource to buffer the loss, the sentiments of loss. So. Those, I, I think that we could probably look at, at historical evidence that, that yes, there's evidence that our people suffered from melancholia, and they worked through it, they became conscious of loss, and they resolved it. They mourned the loss, and they adapted, they assimilated, and they went on with their lives. You, those people probably end up always being a little bit nostalgic, and we might find that in older folks. Now, this inquiry also draws from critical social psychoanalysis. I was just looking at my notes, so I already said that, so we're not going to uh, go into that. Um, the engaging aspects of all these orientations is that they help develop critical consciousness. They help us understand oppressive situation and experiences. They're concerned with the decolonialization of the mind and of society. and they are interested in developing transformative practices of empowerment. More, given the 500 years of colonialism and a divided nation that is on the move, as our friend Duani says, with about almost 4 million Puerto Ricans in the United States, I want to add that I think it's amazing and a little bit worrisome that in social work, or when I studied, that was quite a couple years ago, <laughs> or in psychology, but in the fields of public service, 
that we are not given in our curriculums to look at the work, and it's an amazing work, of the Native American psychologists and the Afro-American psychologists who have now, for the past 30 years, 20 to 30 years, been looking at these issues that now I'm trying to look at with Puerto Ricans. Not that psychologists have not looked at the decolonization paradigm, no. But the notions of coloniality, the notions of, of melancholia, the notions of trauma, the Native Americans, the black Americans, have been for years developing incredible forms of healing. The Native Americans have developed curriculums of community healing activities that are marvelous. It's always amazing to me that you don't hear about this. It's part of a silencing, you know? The North, the, the African Americans have for years been discussing the trauma of slavery, of course. But Puerto Ricans have never discussed really the trauma. The colony and we don't acknowledge We that. haven't acknowledged it. Still, yes. Like pressing yes. those other things. It's, it's like a schizophrenic patient. The patient will yes. never get well if it doesn't yes. admit, if he or she doesn't admit that she's ill. Yes. Everybody can, you know, bowl over and try to help, but if that person himself doesn't seek help, and we have it as a people. Groups have, have looked at colonialism, of course, and the effects, and have been writing so, a few, but it's, we've always kind of skirted it. As, as we've skirted the, the racial issues, you know, we, we've kind of always skirted. No, not us, you know. We're not, we were never uh, enslaved. Our forefathers and foremothers were enslaved. So, the notion that we need to do some healing in Puerto Rico and in the United States, in the Puerto Rican communities, is akin to this, this notion of trauma, to looking at practices that can help us do that. And we need to know what to do first. We need to understand. That's where we know. We're trying to look at the theoretical basis to understand what we need to do. I think what I wrote here was prettier and more, but you know, I try not to read, okay? So in the brief time, and there's a lot of things we're gonna go look at, I just want, I wanna start sharing with you that I wanna move to voices. Our voices, what are some of the voices that we have heard about the reality of the experience of Puerto Ricans in the United States? There has been a boom. I have been absolutely um, energized by the kinds of writings that have come out, mainly in literature. And my good friends back there know, and Carlos already was showing me divided borders back there. There have been, in the last 20 years, tremendous amount of intellectual development, but mostly literature and sociology of the diaspora, but not in the area of psychology, social work, you know? It's been in the literary, and it's been a tremendous uh, looking and examining of the experience of the diaspora. On the part of social work, psychology, it's been examined, but in terms of cultural issues, not getting into, you know, the, the, the depth that literary analysis have gotten into. So in that part, these our fields are a little bit behind. But I want to touch upon some of this so we can move ahead. Some of the voices that we hear, you know, there's nostalgia. Quien soy? Who am I? In la lucha. I'm going and I'm coming. I'm on a, you know, wah wah. Where's the wah wah? I hear you. didn't make it. Okay. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm a diasporican. I'm from here, de aquí, de allá. You know, I'm displaced. These are all words that over the years you hear, and uh, they're, it, they're in the literature about our experience. Where are we from? And you know the last one on the corner, Dusmi. Does anybody here know what that is? That construction was the, the uh, brainchild of a Teun Chancho Figuera 
of the New York Poets Puerto Rican Cafe, who it doesn't mean anything. He constructed it, but it means something very important. It doesn't mean you know the word dusmic. You know, it's not siglas for something. What it is, and that's why I want to start with it. It means the turning of aggression and oppression into strength. They came up with this, and they were interviewed in a magazine that I read years ago. This is in, in Miguel Algarín's book of, of, of Antología. Dusmik was to me the turning of aggression and oppression into strength, which is what we want to do, okay? So I just will read very briefly some of the literary comments, phrases, very briefly, of Puerto Rican writers about the diasporic feeling, the feeling, the subjectivity of being diasporic. Que si rica, ni o rica, Puerto Rica, New York rica, Puerto Rica, America, America, New York rica, Boricua, diaspora rica. Ay, all of these different names are for Puerto Rican. The same thing happens on the other side. In Puerto Rico, it's the terms for black. Que si negro, trigueño, jabao, prieto, moreno, afroboricua. See, there's an issue at home with race, and there's an issue here with who am I ethnically, okay? Am I a Puerto Rican? Who's that? What is it, okay? And Sandy Esteves, my good friend, says, being Puerto Rican born in the Bronx, not really Hibara, not really hablando bien, not yet, not gringa either, but si por torre, which is like an abbreviation. Another one she says, I'm two parts a person. Boricua speak, past and present, alive and oppressed. Tato Laviera says, I will translate this in a second. Ahora regreso con corazón boricua y tú me desprecias, me miras mal. He went back to Puerto Rico and he says, now I come back to Puerto Rico with a Puerto Rican heart and you don't appreciate me, you treat me badly, which is the experience mm -hmm. of going back. And those of us who've been here, have gone back, have had that experience. And Aurora Levin, who is part Jewish and part Puerto Rican, her mother's Puerto Rican, her father is, is, is Jewish American. I knew, history made me. <laughs> Listen to this. My first language was Spanglish. I was born at the crossroads, and I knew. So. You know, it's experiences of trying to identify, trying to make sense, trying to reconcile this experience here with the experience of being here and not here, or from here or not, okay? And interestingly, love, this conflict, however, has also created an amazing amount of productivity. And the point I want to get to, because we're going to look quickly at some studies, is that the colonial identity fractures, fractures the sense of being. And, it, and when something is fractured, you have to work at trying to put together the parts, you don't know how many parts there are, and the pieces, which you may not know which they are, and you may not even be conscious that that's happening, okay? But there's always, in relatively healthy people, a pull towards healing. Just like you cut and you heal, <coughs> you know. There is that pull towards healing. How has the community in the United States pulled away? How has it transformed its mourning to healing? What evidence do we have that that might be happening? The evidence that I think is when I look at the workings of the artist, when I look of artists born, raised, or, or, or in, in the United States, at the creativity of their voices, it seems to me that they're working through these issues of loss, relocation, dislocation, looking for sense of self, looking for sense of activity. Look at the welfare poets. I happen to know their work for the last, I don't know, 10 years. 
They do them, if you don't know them, most of you probably know them. The Woodford Fords are very creative. They use hip hop, they use jam, they use, and, and they speak out, and they are reconstructing their identity. And look at the, the, the play, La Gringa. What happens with La Gringa? It's a play, she goes back to Puerto Rico, it's a play of a Puerto Rican a young woman who's raised here in this image of Puerto Rico, viva Puerto Rico, go back to Puerto Rico, and you go back to Puerto Rico, and you get just, just you know, treated badly. And suddenly, you know, your heart goes to the floor, and she comes back, and what does she learn? She learns what Mariposa Fernandez said. Yo no nací en Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico nació en mí. You know that, that phrase in her poem. I did not, I was not born in Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico was born in me. Okay? She was a black Puerto Rican poet who felt that rage of being denied being Puerto Rican. Those are the identity pools. But what I see is that young people, creative, writing, music, are bridging. I think they're managing the melancholia in a different way. All right? Now, In the Heights is another example, by the way. Because he ends up saying, those who've seen In the Heights, he ends up saying, um, he wasn't going back to Puerto Rico, this is my home. Home is, like they say, where the heart is. And you make, you reconcile those differences. Okay. But then let's look at the next one. Let's look at some studies. Well, let, let's, I knew there would be student, students, so let's go through some definitions, and then we're going to go quickly into some studies. Psyche, the difference between psyche, subjectivity, identity, just to, to, for you to know, okay? The psyche is, is your mind, it's what, you know, is up there, it's conscious, and it's, it's unconscious, it's your thoughts, it interacts with your body. But it's different from subjectivity. Subjectivity is the experience of yourself through yourself. Okay? I mean, those are, you know, you can read it fancy. But subjectivity is your own experience of your life, how you manage it. And the last definition, the basic definition at the beginning, is a quote from an interesting book called Postcolonial Disorders that some Harvard professors um, just put out looking at what they're considering postcolonial societies, okay? And identity is different. Identity is how, you know, who we think we are. Each of us has an identity, you know? And there's different levels of that identity, who you think you are and, and how other people identify with you and how other people perceive you. It's very important to have an identity. It's very important to feel that you know who you are, and that's one of the issues of young Puerto Ricans. Who am I? Am I this? Am I that? Am I? Okay? All right. Move in. Yeah, because I. Okay. We can pass that. Can we just look at that for now? Okay. Because I was watching the. My boss went like this, and I was watching him, so I saw you. <laughs> All right. There, I want to do two things. This is like midpoint. We're going to look at some studies. They're a little bit depressive, <laughs> okay, about us, about the Puerto Ricans. So we're going to look at these studies. I want to do that in one sense because I want to look at data, okay? What are some of the studies, heavy-duty studies, saying? I'm just going to quickly, I'm not going to read the whole thing. We're going to look description and what are the results, okay? Because there's a few. And I want to do this because I want it as a backdrop to looking at two cases and to looking at an article that I wrote on Puerto Rican identity in the adolescence. Okay? All right. The first study is, is, was done, the, and the data comes from a huge database that is evidence from the National Health Interview Survey, NHIS. Very well known, very heavy. These guys from Texas wrote it up. Okay? <laughs> Oh, that's recent. <coughs> this one was 19, uh, 2005. I try to look at the studies done in the last uh, 10 years. Actually done last 10 years. 
we could have gotten that database and done the same thing. They, you know, they, they, they got the database and said, okay. This, the results, okay? The N, your sample, look at that. 1,602,032. Uh, 1, That's a big sample, all right? But what are they looking at? They're looking at a bunch of different groups of people. Puerto Ricans, Native Americans, Cubans, blah, blah, blah. Let's see what the results are. Puerto Ricans are one of the five groups which are overrepresented in lowest education, unemployment, low income. You didn't need to know this, given the, what we heard a couple of weeks ago, all right? African Americans, Native Americans, Mexican Americans, and Mexican and Cubans are part of that. But look at what what is more striking. Puerto Ricans are less likely to be married. The other ones are more likely. That is an interesting finding. Puerto Ricans are less likely to be married. So I was surprised. Highest average levels of distress are who? Why should we be surprised? Native Americans who were dispossessed of their lands. By racial, mixed racial, that's a new finding. That was unexpected in the study because it hadn't happened before because they didn't have an identifier for biracial mm -hmm. or mixed racial. Because of that identifier being, they got the data. Who are the highest levels of distress? And distress here in the study are measured by these different official measures. You know, it's controlled. We don't have to worry about the methodology. I have an answer. I had a question. Yeah, please. Methodology. How, okay. did, how did they come up with the different variables and how? Well, this, this is a large database. And I guess this group wanted to look at this particular uh, group of, of, of you know, Latinos. And well, not only Latinos, you know, ethnic groups. They wanted to do a study on ethnic groups. And the interesting thing is that there is a comparison with whites somewhere along the line. But the highest average levels of distress are the people that are the most exploited and the most colonized. The blacks are not, which is interesting, given the history, okay? So the highest average level of distress is the Native Americans, racial mix, and Puerto Ricans. The average core score for the whole sample was 2.52, and, and the Native Americans were 3.51, the T-score, the average T-score, the racially mixed, and the Puerto Ricans, okay? There were no other uh, significant differences. Higher scores in general were for women. Always women, regardless of the ethnicity, are gonna be high mm -hmm. on distress scores and depression. That's nothing new. The literature has been saying that for a long time. The most acculturated is an interesting finding. We're gonna see it again. The most acculturated ethnic folk of those, and you're going to see in Puerto Ricans, are being with the highest depressed scores. Now that's a very interesting finding. Um, see what else we want to look on there? And of course, low levels of education, less economically stable, unemployed, of course people are depressed. Just the fact that you don't have a job is depressing, okay? But low education, has always been associated with depression. All right? Low SES, unemployment. What other interesting finding? Across ethnic subgroups, distress tends to be higher among women native born. Native born, again, English speaking. That is very interesting. Nativity, foreign born nativity, the concept of those being foreign born ends up being better, <laughs> more protective, and we'll, we can talk about why. No, we'll, in the discussion, we'll see why, okay? Uh, adjusted for sex and age, Puerto Ricans report higher levels of distress compared to non-Hispanic whites. Of course, we expected them, right? Because the, the uh, average T-score for whites was something like 2.21 or something like that, right? Um, I think for that study, unless anybody has a question, we know that the impact of unemployment on distress is greatest on Puerto Ricans. The impact of chronic illness is also more pronounced for Puerto Ricans. So, you know, we're coming out pretty bad here in that study. How do you 
how do they go about cleaning the sample and how do you know that it's not flawed? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I think when I read the methodological part, you know, this, these people didn't do the study. These are studies, this is the National Health Review, either they're done in Washington, these are big, huge databases that the Center for uh, Epidemiological Studies or the Haynes, for example, which is another study, that do, okay? And then people get the database and use it. So I don't th think that they were doing the study because many people do that, all right, from the, from, if I remember completely. So these are, stuff, it's a huge, mm -hmm. it's a huge. And they get done on different aspects of health, okay? And then different people use that data and study the aspects that they want, all right? And these people are interested in studying, right? But it's a national study. Then the other, this next study is also comes from a very big sample, it, but but she took only 1,519 Puerto Ricans. Okay, this was the Haynes study. This is the nutrition, the health and and Hispanic health and nutrition survey. This is a survey that's done also, you know, through these big groups and different people use the data. Okay, what are the results? Again. The results will tell us one thing, again, the same thing. The more acculturated the male, the more likely to be depressed in terms of affect and somatic symptoms. Acculturation in this was measured by a simple scale of language. Acculturation in the other study was measured by a standard. There's quite a few acculturation scales. They've been criticized for many years. They've been proved in the last few years. But uh, those scales, you know, we can all say that, you know, studies, I take them lightly. But when I see two or three studies or more that have the same tendencies, then I say, oh, this is worrisome. So what is worrisome from these two studies so far, aside from the fact that Puerto Ricans are higher on everything, but the second was just all Puerto Rican, the notion that more time in the United States, English speaking is more associated with more depression. And in, in, and in the case of the second study, and we're going to see another one with men. Would that be like a similar to what came to like self hatred? Well, you're figuring out. A li internalized self hatred. There's a, lo a lot of things we could hypothesize. What, that's what we're going to be discussing in a few minutes. What do you think, I want to hear you, what do you think is happening to these men? Why are Puerto Rican men who've been here longer, okay, English dominant, they should be dominating the scene, and they're not. They're depressed. So let's see the other study. The other study is also a big study, okay? Oh, well, this is, the reason I put it there because I knew that, that I wanted to, to do this table, this is a review of studies, so we'll, it's, it has all the other studies. So we'll go on to the Alegria one. I think it's the next one. Mm -hmm. First one. Okay. Nativity, oh no, that's not the one, but okay. Nat uh, uh, Margarita Alegria and her group from Cambridge Hospital, Harvard School of Medicine, um, is, is, does very, very good work. Um, she's an excellent social psychologist. And she's been looking for the last, I don't know how many years, at comparing, okay? And what is here is that what we see here, I couldn't get the study because the journal is a medical journal. It's not here. We tried to get it right. So all I had was the summary, so I put mm -hmm. the summary. Uh, but <clears throat> what we do see is the inverse, that the foreign-born um, have a protective, have lower depression. Okay? They put it in the sense of a protective effect of foreign-born nativity, all right? So probably the whole article, when I see all the results, might say the same thing that we're looking, that if you're not foreign-born, if you're longer here, you may end up having more depression. Okay? Let's go to the next alegria. This is a summary. This is a summary. The next alegria one. Can I Yeah, Prevalence. Yeah, prevalence is a very nice study, and this uh, is using the National Institute of 
of health um, data. It's a huge household sample. Why? Three, three, three hundred was what? It might be in Three hundred. Um, again, Puerto Ricans' highest overall lifetime. This is the this study. Just for you to know, if anybody is really interested in epidemiology. For years now, they, they have this diagnostic interview schedule. It's the latest thing in the avenue. It was what I used when it was constructed at UCLA in 1982 to do my dissertation. Since then, it's been used, it's been standardized, and it is the diagnostic instrument for community surveys, you know, epidemiological. So it's, it's been validated and it gets used a lot. Um, and it gives you diagnoses. It is computer um, process, and you get diagnosis. So it's pretty heavy, or pretty well developed. Uh, Puerto Ricans have the highest overall lifetime. There's questions about lifetime and questions about past year prevalence. So they're looking at prevalence over life, uh, estimating, and past year. Puerto Ricans have the highest among four Latino subgroups. Okay, um, U.S.-born Latinos were significantly more likely than Latino immigrants, that's all Latinos, to fulfill lifetime criteria for psychiatric disorders, right? Uh, overall tend in, 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 the, in the sample, longer residence in the United States with, associated with increased prevalence of lifetime rates. Uh, psychiatric disorder rates higher among third generation respondents. Psychiatric disorders um, were higher for Puerto Ricans than Cuban and Mexican. That has come out in various studies. Puerto Ricans are higher than other Latino groups. Puerto Ricans were more likely to have depressive disorders, were more likely than Cuban men to have history of anxiety or substance abuse. Puerto Rican women had higher odds of having history of substance abuse disorder. Uh, Cuban men and women in other groups were less likely to fulfill criteria for having history. So um, that's, that, those studies are really impressive, right? The others, um, the others are reviews, but we don't, right? All right, so let's just take a few minutes. Have you seen any of these uh, studies? Did you know any of this data? You know, those? What do you think of it? I, I, what, what do you make of it? What, you know, why should Puerto Rican men in three studies that have been living more time in the United States that are adults, okay, have higher depression? And what, what, let, me, let me move into a case, okay? Um, uh, the second case I think you'll be more interested in. But this case, the reason I want to bring up this case is because it, it, it is of a male Puerto Rican um, that I saw many years ago in Massachusetts. And I learned a lot uh, from him. Um, is this no, I don't know if we'll have time to do this. That was the article on it. Um, but this was a Puerto Rican man who was an ex cane cutter. I didn't see it here. Um, he was 52 years old when I saw him. He, um, he had been in, in the United States for about a year. He had lost his job. This was in 1982, something like that, mm -hmm. 1983, in Massachusetts. He had lost his job. He was here with the family. He had two or three kids. He was living right near Villa Victoria, which is a part of the pudding community in Massachusetts. <clears throat> and he hadn't, he, he hadn't, uh, the reason he came up to the United States is because he had a brother here, and he for years couldn't get a job in Puerto Rico. Once he stopped, once the, the uh, sugar mills stopped in Puerto Rico in the late 70s, mm -hmm. the last one in the late 70s, I think it was, he lost the job. And, and he was just doing what's called chiripeo, which is, you know, uh, little things, you know, doing chores and, and, and what is it called, handyman type things. And he comes to the United States and his brother gets him a job at a factory putting nuts and bolts, okay? And he comes in with depression and feeling that his life is over, he doesn't know what to do, 
he, he's angry. He, everybody's told him that he's angry. His wife's told him he's angry. He's threatening him that you better get help because, you know, anger is another form of, of internalized or externalized depression as we conceptualize it. And so he comes in and start doing a history and he starts talking about when he was a cane, a, cane, uh, a sugar cane cutter and when he was out in the fields and that whole experience. I love histories and narratives, you know. So, you know, it, for me it was, it was incredible to hear him. But he came with the symptom, not of anger, he came with a somatic symptom. He came with a symptom that his back hurt. Mm -hmm. Now, at that time, even though I was just getting my PhD, things didn't quite come together. <laughs> I didn't quite get to analyze what was happening in this man until years later. Did I have like, oh my God, I'm, you know? You just, it was years after that I was able to really understand what I think was happening with this man. Think of it. He's depressed, he's angry, he was a cane cutter, a sugar cane cutter since he was a kid. I mean a kid, 14, 15 years old, his whole life. He comes in complaining that his back hurts. How do you cut cake? What do you always use? Not that it necessarily has to hurt, but what do you always use? Okay. If we do an analysis, psychoanalytically, of his complaint of his history and we incorporate the notion of a loss a trauma for a loss a loss that he did not mourn because he he didn't realize that that was a real loss he lost not the fact that you lose the job that is a loss he lost something more he lost livelihood he lost his identification he didn't just lose leaving the island because he didn't have a job. He lost his whole world vision, his whole sense of being. That's a very difficult situation to be in. His back, he had no physiological reason to have back pain. He had somaticized, that's what somatization is, the pain through a mechanism in his psyche. But the pain reminded him that symptom was the memory of the loss. And while he had the symptom, he was closer and had a contact with that loss. I started to, to think years later about it and him telling us how you know, all the days and, and what happened. His pain was a pain in his soul, you know. He really, it wasn't a pain in his back, but it was a pain out of a loss. And it was a pain, I think, because of melancholia, because he did not mourn all his losses. And he hadn't worked them through. Would I to see him now, okay, or run a group of men, with depression, or even on depression, <clears throat> the ways that one works, you know, these losses. But, you know, I had to, I'm putting it together because part of what may be happening, part of what may be happening, you mentioned one part of it, with the depression of Puerto Rican men who have been in the United States longer, who speak English preferably, is that one of the things that we could hypothesize or a question that we would have, a research question is, is it possible that these men are suffering from a sense of loss of values, loss of a country, a place? They have maybe, inter see we, don't, we can't know that right now, but we can hypothesize, so have they integrated into an American society that maybe doesn't really want them? Here they achieve what they wanted, Learn English, are stable, are here, but they made it, and yet they're depressed. Is it possible? Those are some of the things that one could think of 
wondering. I think the fact of men who don't have a job, who have the the situations at home, of course, that are unemployed, they have burdens, they feel they're worthless. All these things create a lot of depression in anybody. It doesn't have to be a man. You know. But we also have to look at the possibility that sometimes the causes of depression are not so easily recognizable. You know. And part of what we're seeing, I'm wondering, I'm beginning to wonder with these statistics is loss. Could the sense also of betrayal of their native land be causing... That causes guilt, mm -hmm. okay? And guilt is and one of the feelings of depression. So, yes. But going back to the question, oh, sorry, what's your name? Ezekiel, Ezekiel. 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 I'm, I'm New Yorkian. <laughs> okay, so that's, that's fine. That's, a, that's an identity. That's an identity. Yes. There we go. But his, I think if I understood his, his point, uh, it's about, you know, I'm removed from, from the experience yeah. of the yeah. sugar cane color. And yet, uh, my identity is a milieu of mm -hmm. experiences mm -hmm. that are somewhat distant from those of prior generations. Yet the data there suggests that, that it's, uh, they, they face, generationally, not you, but generationally, more uh, psychosomatic symptoms that might be indicators. You know, the more acculturated you are, the worse you are. Okay? It's supposed to be the reverse. But now, it, it, you're telling me, uh, what I understand is that are those circumstances of colonialism and oppression but he yeah. made a very compelling case. I've removed from that experience. Mm -hmm. So how, how exactly is the mechanism of transmission from well, parents? You have very good to adaptive. To you know, parents, very good adaptive ability. <laughs> <laughs> I, I um, and I'm trying to, to establish the notion that maybe as Puerto Ricans, whether the island, whether here, we haven't looked at this concept mm -hmm. of how we have been traumatized. We have accepted the trauma individually and been depressed and angry and enraged. And our families have lived those experiences of anger and rage. Because anger is one of the manifestations most common amongst Puerto Ricans. And that's, that's another set of studies. Anger. Attack on the nervios and anger. And I think we're enraged people. But we have reason to be enraged. But we have not framed that enraged in a model of trauma and loss. And I, who have been a psychologist for a bunch of years, <laughs> over 25, <laughs> well, no, 30, I think, you know, and now beginning to say, I, we've worked with trauma all life, because trauma is a concept, mm -hmm. you know, trauma and vis in, 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 in victimized, PTSD, but this is a different kind of trauma. And I'm realizing that as I'm getting close to it now, later on in my professional life, that I think that as a people, whether here or there, we have not looked at the trauma experience. That's why I mentioned the Native American and the Afro American, because they have been working on these issues for some time. So I think what I'd like to mention now is this case study, for the sake of time, I'm not going to go into the article. I'm just going to talk about this youth because this youth is an example of many of you. This young boy that I'm going to talk about, but years, a few years earlier, his issues of identity, his trauma, okay, and how we worked on it because I wanted to present some data and then I wanted to present a case that might exemplify that depression in men, that trauma in men. But then I also wanted to ish talk about issues of identity and present a case of a young man and ideas about how to work and what that has to do for work here, for work with students, okay? So briefly, I'm just going to talk a little bit about Yo. I didn't realize that Yo, when I met him, meant Jo. So I see this 15-year-old kid in Worcester, Massachusetts, <clears throat> who got referred to us. <clears throat> in those years, we were getting referred a lot of Puerto Rican boys who were in trouble with the law, nothing new, okay? 
So the courts were saying to them, you know, they, they put this in the bad guys. Oh, you go to therapy, or you go to juvenile hall, okay? Or detention center. It's awful. Of course, you're not dumb. I'll go to therapy, sure, okay? So Yo was a 15-year-old boy that precisely when he first came to see me, he says, Yo, doctor, yo. And I, I thought that was a greeting, right? And then I found out that he had named himself. Naming is very important. He had named himself Yo, but Yo in Spanish is I, Yo, I, right? He had, you know, put it in the lingo of the young person, Yo. Who was Yo? Yo was a very light Puerto Rican. He was a blonde Puerto Rican, son of a southern white mother and a Puerto Rican male. I never saw him, so I don't know uh, what he looked like. But Yo was a very light Puerto Rican, and that was one of his issues. But who was Yo's friends? Black Puerto Rican, black Afro-Americans. Why? Because they lived in the housing projects. And that's who was there. They weren't Asians. They weren't Mexicans at that time. They weren't Dominicans. Now they might be. Okay? At that time, it was black, white, poor, and Puerto Rican in this housing project in, in, Massachusetts, in Worcester, Massachusetts. And he came to see me because we had announced that we were going to form a group of Puerto Rican boys. Okay? I was the director of the Hispanic program in, in this place, and I was very much interested in groups, and I was working with youth, and I knew that identity was an issue. So Yo was perfect. Yo had a different kind of identity issue. He was biracial. He wanted to be Puerto Rican, but couldn't identify as one. He did not speak in Spanish. Everything was English. His mother did not speak Spanish because she was white American. She never learned Spanish. And his father came and went, okay? So he wasn't there as a model, as a Puerto Rican. But Yo lived in the Puerto Rican community, okay? And his desire was to identify as a Puerto Rican. Okay? He had this fantasy that that's what he wanted, okay? What we did with this group of young boys is, is in this article that I, I published, and I really like this article. <laughs> It's Skin Soy Who I Am, Identity Issues of Puerto Rican Adolescents. And, and, and we'll put it on for you so you can look at it. Basically, when I started to work with all these kids, I realized that the identity issues are absolutely prevalent. He was one example. But then there was the son of the Pentecostal person, super rigid. Then there was the Puerto Rican boy that did speak Spanish and, and wanted to them, the other Puerto Rican boys to accept them. So there was issues of language. There was issues, no, who's more Puerto Rican? You know, you Puerto Rican, my Puerto Rican, I don't speak English, I don't speak Spanish, you know. All these issues were there. Those are the issues of our community today. They were manifesting these issues. And I thought, oh my God. I allowed five in the group, another therapist, psychiatric social worker, took the other five. We didn't want these kids to go into juvenile hall. We were really socially committed. You know, we wanted to make this thing go. This was for me a very important experience because I wanted to develop a model of working with uh, young Puerto Ricans that have issues and have behavior problems. But he really didn't have a serious behavior problem. He had a psyche problem. His behavior problem was anger. He was angry, he was frustrated, he wanted to be what society wasn't allowing him to be, but he didn't really know what that was either. What did we do in therapy? Okay. Now the kinds of, I'm just gonna, the, the article mentions a series of things. I'm only gonna mention two or three that specifically were done thinking about helping these kids reconstruct history. Where did that come from? That came from the theories of Martin Baro of recovering memory, which is also similar to the trauma theory. You need to recover a memory, even if it wasn't yours. 
You need to have anchor yourself. You have to have the base. You have to have a springboard. Many of our young kids that are in so much trouble or angry or depressed don't have a sense of self because they don't, they're not anchored. A tree has to grow with tierra, you know, with, with you can't just grow unless it's one of these that grow in water, in, in air, you know. You have to have a base. You need to have some foundation. And usually that foundation is family, culture, traditions. So I decided that what we needed to do, and this was in discussion with with the colleague that we had the other group, what we wanted to do since, you know, you can't sit down with young people, you know, at that time it wasn't rap, by the way, okay? Now I would do rap therapy, but at that time it wasn't rap. It wasn't even hip hop, that was 1982. It was still like salsa, I guess, you know, but it wasn't, rap came, what, in the 90s, late 80s, and 90s, mid 80s? 70s, late 70s. Late 70s? 70s? Late 70s? Late 70s? <laughs> no, I'm too young. Yeah. Yeah. But not in Worcester. <laughs> yeah, that's not New York. Yeah, he wants to speak to the food for it, though. Yeah. I, I'm going to give some examples precisely how we searched, not totally obtained, but yes, on that route to authenticity. Because authenticity is part of what, what young people want. It's part of identity. You want to be authentic. You want to know who you are, and to be who you are, you, 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 you end up being authentic, okay? Knowing that this was a, an angry group of kids, <laughs> but you know, adolescents, the anger, if, if they know that you're not messing with their head, if you find that out, those of you who want to be therapists, you know, if young people know that you're for real, and you're there, they hang on, and they deal with you, and they don't give you a hard time, okay? If they know that, you know, you're not authentic, you've lost it. Two, three, suge three, two suggestions, because I'm just told we're running out of time. But these are very important suggestions, and the article has more. I knew they needed to, to develop their history. One of the things, very basic, very simple, classic, classic to us, is the genogram. A genogram is the genealogy of your family. If you need to start getting yourself anchored and rooted, I have often used the genogram in families and youth. We all, they all learned how to do it. Of course, we had the model, you know, and you photocopied and you had it all. They all learned how to do the genogram. They had to do it together. They laughed through it. They talked about it. And then they had to take it home. And when they came back, what was, what was the goal? We were trying for them to get history of family. History. Now, that it can be painful if there's no family. But usually there is family because we ask them to go back to the grandparents. Where are they? Who are they? You know, the uncles, the aunts. What happened? When did it happen? And they came back with life stories that we agreed we had to hear them, but we wanted to take them for them to take home. We wanted them to hear their life story. And it was an incredible, cathartic, now there's another psychoanalytic term, experience. They came back and told us, you know, and they showed us, and they shared. Well, no, you know, I had, this yo was a kid at risk of heavy depression and serious behavior problems because he was lost in the world. He was one child only. His father came in and out. He didn't have a sense of who he was, okay? So he was at risk of, of psychological problems. And he started to get his history. He found out things that he didn't know. Then, of course, he said to his mother, how come, how come I didn't know that? Sometimes parents don't say a lot of things, and you have to find out after they die or when they're sick, and you didn't find out that maybe you had a baby brother that died when you were born, or that you had... Uh, an aunt that went off to do some crazy thing in wherever, you know, you start to find out the ghost of the family and things that may have been haunting the family. 
And it's a very interesting experience with adolescents because all this history, what they don't have, starts to come out. And then they start to think, oh, wait a minute, I, gotta, I look for photographs. And then there were projects that they were assigned to do with their parents, with their mother. Why did we want to do that? To get some bonds that weren't there. Getting photos, creating that genogram with photos. Right? So that was that was a very big project. It was extremely therapeutic, really. I thought it was it was a beautiful project. For various weeks, we worked on that, and then we moved to the second activity. I I, I want to just move on, but I tell you, the goal of that and the goal of the other things that I mentioned here is precisely to help youth recapture, restructure, and re-nurture their therapeutic self and their sense of self, you know, because, because we care of our generation. We care for our people, you know, and our young people who need help. We can help them with these tools that understand not just clinical, but understand the clinical in relation to our sense of trauma, of loss, of being colonialized, of having internalized the aggressor, and if we have those paradigms as a therapist, right, it's easier for us to then think of activities of this nature that are therapeutic. Quickly, some of the th research questions, because we're, we're moving right along. That we have time. You don't have time for the research questions? Okay. All right. Um, we're going to put this, as soon as I get all the uh, references, this is pretty minute. Uh, this will be in the central website under my name, and we'll put this so you can look at some of the research questions that came out of the case, that came out of the data, and the kinds of activities that I'm suggesting as a socially committed uh, practitioner, I'm not practicing right now, except that it's central, um, things that I think activities that I think we need to do in our communities um, so we can have strong, vibrant, resilient communities um, and alternatives. So it's here and I should leave it at that, okay? So we can have a little bit of time, right? We have a few minutes.